Broadcasting live from overgrown farmland on the plain of Innistrad, this is Tap Tap Concede. Welcome everybody to Tap Tap Concede. My name is Graham. Joining me is Cameron. Uh Uh-huh. And Nelson. I am also here. And today we are going to be talking about some of the forthcoming Stranger Things cards. I say some because at time of recording on Thursday the 14th, they have not all been revealed. And some banned and suspended announcements and also some digital errata (laughs) but first a reminder that for physical cards you can do no better than card kingdom check out cardkingdom.com slash lrr that lets them know that we sent you and we do that because we think they're great they have excellent prices very fast shipping spectacular customer service and if you tell them loading ready run sent me button please they'll give you a little one inch button which i think I think I should have looked this up before we started recording. I think we're still on Medium Gargadon. Hello, my name is Medium Gargadon. As of the beginning of the month, we have tipped over to upkeep, draw, whoops, untap. Nice. Because <laughs> everyone forgets to untap. It's like, all right, okay, when I upkeep, I'm going to draw my card. Oh, wait, I should untap my lands and my creatures from last turn. Okay, all right, now we begin the turn. So enjoy that one. Oh, wait, I had an upkeep trigger. Okay, let's do that now. Oh, I guess yeah. we should call a judge. Can I attack first? I'll just, just I'll attack and then we'll call a judge. <laughs> let me hang on. Let me let me let me discard to end of end of turn. Wait, I forgot at the end of your last turn. I meant to flash in this. Thanks to our Patreons at uh, patreon.com forward slash loading ready run. Keeping the lights on and keeping us fed so that we can tell terrible jokes like the last one I just dude you know smooth spewed out yeah terrific thank you oh i meant to counter your bomb last turn right yeah okay so that let's we'll play through it all yeah so we're finally seeing the first formal cards from universes beyond despite the you know the everything that sort of led us here like the walking dead and you know i mean even going further back the like transformers and my little pony stuff that was available at uh, comic-con this is the first one that's actually formally like, no, no, this is the universe is beyond thing. Intellectual properties that Hasbro has known beyond. <laughs> and this is a forthcoming secret layer to do with Stranger Things. Now, annoyingly, it sounds like the secret layer information for this and other secret layers, I think, is going to be announced like this afternoon, which is a little frustrating because you'll be hearing this on Monday and it'll be, you know, days out at this point. But I guess we'll talk about that all next episode. But let me tell you what we do know about Chief Jim Hopper, who is two red white for a 4-4 legendary human soldier with menace, which is an interesting interpretation. Whenever Chief Jim Hopper attacks, investigate once for each non-token attacking creature. Sign me up. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, And then this interesting ability, friends forever. And the reminder text on that is you can have two commanders if both have friends forever. Now, that is functionally the same as partner because partner was introduced in Battle Bond and it was specifically partner with. And then I believe it was then later updated. It's my timeline might be wrong on this, but it was later updated to just be partner and you can have two commanders if they both have partner. So this is the same sort of thing, but it's a, it's a different category they've clarified that it's like when these are reprinted speaking of getting things out of order let me talk about that first so here's the thing about the universe is beyond they've said that within i don't know if it was within six months or at least after six months at some point there's six months is a relevant amount of time but at some point these cards will be functionally reprinted as regular magic cards in an actual magic set of some form that's completely separated from the Stranger Things IP. So if you like the function of this card and you don't care about Stranger Things and you don't want to get a secret layer, there will be an opportunity six months down the line to get a card that is in every way identical to this card. It just has a different name and different art. Hmm. So that's that's good. I think that's generally a good idea. I'm going to guess it'll come out in a commander set since these have partner probably yeah or they have friends forever which i think also aaron Forsyth tweeted out that like friends forever will stay like those words are going to be the same the friends forever is going to stay and then they're not going to errata that to become part of partner for whatever reason they want to keep the friends forever cards as a distinct set from 
cards with partner. So I, I don't know why, but I guess they were like, there's too many partners. They probably have something that they believe is a good reason for that. I mean, Friends Forever seems like an awfully optimistic set of words for people from a horror franchise. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> We're going to be friends forever. Yeah. Where'd I put my machete? As long as we both live, however many minutes that is. I got to say, I'm a fan of the the show, Stranger Things. I like it a lot. And I'm just now learning that Hopper had a first name. So that's cool. <laughs> so I guess when these cards come out in probably a Commander box set, I'm going to guess, but it's just a guess. Only the name will change. Do we know? Have we seen any of these? Like had the... The Walking Dead cards don't have another functional reprint yet, and they're not. No, they don't. And they're not, technically speaking, part of Universes right. Beyond, so we don't know that they yeah. necessarily ever will. But that was something that they said about all of these going forward. So we know these will. So it'll be some other name for a legendary human soldier. I assume the types stay the same. That's That was my guess. That's what I was driving towards. I wonder if the type is going to be part of the... Like, probably. It just seems like it could be a gray area. Yeah. You know, so whether we know there'll be a soldier. Yeah. Yeah. The other Stranger Things card is 11, the Mage. One blue, black, red for a 3-5 legendary human wizard. Your maximum hand size is 11, which is cute. Whenever 11, the Mage attacks, you draw a card and lose one life. Then, if you have 11 or more cards in your hand, you may cast an instant or sorcery spell from your hand without paying its mana cost. Ooh. Powerful. Yeah. And 11 also has friends forever. So you could have a big, actually, it's not even Grixis. It's, you could have a four-color non-green commander deck with both of these in, in charge of it. That's a, this seems like it's going to be a fun commander, actually. The, just like one in a full Grixis, maximum hand size is 11, and you probably get to cast stuff for free. That seems pretty spicy. Yeah. Yeah, I like the on attack triggers. That's a good place for commanders to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You actually have to like untap and then rumble with them. Or at least equip, you know, the shoes. Live, laugh, lightning greaves. Yeah. <laughs> Man, there's a band that's a long time in coming. <laughs> there, put myself out there. For business inquiries, contact Cameron. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially since they printed Swiftfoot boots, so now there's just two of them. Yeah. They were like, no, we fix lightning greaves. And it's like, yeah, but you didn't take the greaves away. Not that I'm saying that you should. I'm just, I just think it's funny. I'm saying you should. I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm generating traffic, Graham. Ah, right. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Band that's a long time coming. I thought you said band, like a musical collective that's a long time coming, named Live, Laugh, Lightning Greaves. But if, hey, if you don't want that one, you know, for business inquiries, you know, tag me on Twitter. Mm -hmm. TG will join your Live, Laugh, Lightning Greaves band. <laughs> or maybe Cameron and I should come as a package. Yeah. I frequently do. <laughs> nice. So you can cut that, Jordan. <laughs> But will she? <laughs> so knowing that we're going to see, uh, you know, functional reprints of these things within six months, I have, I mean, we've been over this a bajillion times on the podcast, it feels like, and I, I just cannot muster uh, enough rage to care. You know, they're, they'll make the Stranger Things secret lair and me as someone who hasn't really watched it i will be like cool i'm that's sweet that that exists i guess i don't doesn't affect me that card looks mechanically interesting and i look forward to getting one later you know <laughs> like i sounds and these cards do both sound mechanically interesting i think this is a uh, pretty neat yeah i agree i think they're they're interesting cards with that obviously fulfill functions in the decks that want them you can build around them they seem fun as mm -hmm. commanders yeah, I think one of the the bonus points of like the bubbling over of so many sets per year is that like even if there's a bunch of stuff that comes out that you don't like, there's still enough stuff that comes out every year that you do like that feels familiar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Somebody on the subreddit did refer to Friends Forever as the the horsemanship of partner. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Friends Forever is to partner as horsemanship is to flying. Yeah, we can't do away with horsemanship or functionally errata. That would just yeah. not make sense. What do you think the Dilu horse flies? Yeah. So anyway, I look forward to seeing the rest of these cards and then personally not buying that secret layer. But if you want to, then then you should. I think there's going to be a whole bunch of other secret layers that they're probably announcing at the same time. So we'll go over those in more detail next time. There was a big announcement, though, 
on banned and restricted announcements, banned and restricted cards. The announcement was not of announcements. It was the announcement. Great. Good. We all got that. Excellent. So standard, no change, but they're keeping an eye on Alrin's Epiphany and Essica's Chariot. I watched a bit of the world championships and the Epiphany deck. I think it was Grixis Epiphany Mm -hmm. was pretty well represented in the top top eight to, I didn't I don't I don't actually have like rundown of the decks handy but there was a lot of Alrin's Epiphany flying around flying around the tournament I don't know Nelson did you uh, watch any of it I just watched a bit of day one and I was excited to get to watch more but then had you know a typical busy weekend and obviously got lots of it spoiled for me on Twitter so I haven't been back but yeah I think in stand in this standard format you should probably be playing one of these two cards unless you feel really good about your mono white deck because there's a there's a bit of that too. That seems to be the shape of the format right now. And that I really like that Arena gave you an event to be like, hey, here's the here's the 16 World Championships decks. Play with them um, against against other people playing the decks. And you even get to have an avatar that's one of the world champions that you chose mm-hmm. to play their deck. So like that's that's really cool. Four yeah. decks were Jan Merkel playing Grixis Epiphany, which was using stuff like Smoldering Egg and Leer. Disciple of the Drowned. Leer lets you flash back anything from your graveyard for its casting cost. And uh, four copies of Alrin's Epiphany. Jean-Emmanuel Dupra was the only one not playing Alrin's Epiphany. And he was playing Teemer Treasures with uh, Goldspan Dragon and and the and the Chariot. Yuta Takahashi was playing a deck that they called Is It Dragons, but also had three copies of Alrin's Epiphany. <laughs> <laughs> but it was playing the gold span dragons right? yeah it was playing four gold span dragons yeah. and four smoldering eggs which turn into a dragon but you know also three three copies of Alrin's epiphany yeah the rest of the rest of the deck list matters here i think yeah yeah it does yeah. that seems like a fine thing to do with an extra turn yeah exactly yeah exactly and then andre strasky was playing the is it epiphany deck which is again Alrin's epiphany and actually there's no there's no creatures in the main board in the Is It Epiphany deck. Oh? Yeah. You just win with this Hall of the Storm Giants and the birds. Yeah, it's Shatter Skull Smashing, Expressive Iteration, Alrin's Epiphany, Burn Down the House. So Burn Down the House makes creatures, Alrin's Epiphany makes creatures, and then the big one, of course, is Hall of the Storm Giants, which is the creature land from Kaldheim that turns into a 7-7 giant with Ward 3. So, tokens. Mm-hmm. I see standard remains the format of cowards. <laughs> <laughs> i like how many of these decks had like a spike field hazard just kicking around in fact yeah like i did see that legendary top deck yeah that was pretty pretty spicy all three of the decks running epiphany the ones that were not team or treasures are all running one or two spike field hazard just to like just to just to get some stuff which is kind of neat but yeah, there was some very, very good gameplay from what little I was able to watch. So I, I recommend you uh, check it out if you're interested in some 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 standard gameplay. But yeah, that's why, you know, they're like, all right, look, we know about the Epiphany. We're keeping an eye on it. But, you know, we this is stuff we've seen. By we, I mean like the three of us. We've seen this before where there's a card that dominates at a specific event, a specific pro tour, for example. And, you know, there's like, oh, you know, that has to be banned. But by the time the next event happens, you know, the format has corrected for it. I don't know what the state of that kind of thing is these days, because I don't even know what the next event is. It Like, you know, the, the state of organized play is like really kind of up in the air. And I don't play standard on arena, so I don't know how quickly the metagame sort of shifts and wobbles there. But, I, you know, it, it probably doesn't need banning because it's probably just like how everyone knows how good Alrin's Epiphany is and maybe the meta will shift to to you know to correct for it as they say in the article after reviewing MTG Arena metagame data uh, recent online events including world championships and considering the upcoming release of Crimson Vow we've decided not to make changes at this time so you know so they're gonna wait till Crimson Vow comes out and then see what the standard metagame is like in historic three changes well three normal changes and then some other stuff that we'll get into in a second so tybalt's trickery is banned don't let the door hit your ass on the way out memory lapse is suspended and brainstorm is now fully banned from being previously suspended (laughs) boohoo that's all about right yeah i didn't realize that there was even more shenanigans with tybalt's trickery because there's throws of chaos which i think is from 
Is it is this from Jumpstart or Yeah, Jumpstart Historic Horizons. It's from Modern Horizons too, but yeah, it's bat into into Arena through the Jumpstart set. Yeah, did you sorry, I think I, I explained how this deck works, but it might have been a podcast you were on, not on Graham. But yeah, I pl- I played this trickery uh throws deck for a while and I think I even took it I, I got to like five and three in the most recent Historic Arena open. But I, you know, I'm a little Just, sad about it. I haven't been playing Historic since the last I came out. As a refresher, what's the the TLDR on on how this interacts? It's a bit like Polymorph or that other four mana one that uh, can go get from Kaladesh that can go get the Platinum Imperium. It's a four mana sorcery, a Throws of of Chaos that just says Cascade. And then it also has a retrace. So Cascade mm. is where you go get another spell for free. Retrace lets you cast this again from your graveyard for a land. So on turn four or turn three, if you manage to get a Magma Opus uh, treasure token, so you can go a little earlier, you cast your Throws of Chaos and then you Cascade into a Tybalt's Trickery every time because you're just playing four Tybalt's Trickery and nothing else that costs less than four mana in your deck. So right away, it's like, you know, we're playing no one, two or three drops and it's historic, so you will sometimes just lose because your opponent killed you fairly on turn three with their Muxus or whatever. So that, like, it, it's got a self-regulating check right there. And then what Tybalt's Trickery does is it counters your Throws of Chaos. So you target your own spell with, with Tybalt's Trickery, and then you mill one, two, or three cards. Sometimes you mill another Tybalt's Trickery, which can be bad. And then you reveal a spell, you reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a card that's not Throws of Chaos, and you can cast it. If you hit another copy of Tybalt Trickery with that last part of the resolution, you just miss because you can't you can't counter anything on the stack anymore. And otherwise, you hit something like Omniscience or Ulamog or the Sphinx of Lost Truth or the Sarah's Emissary, some huge you know seven plus mana spell that hopefully leads to you winning the game. The best one usually is Ulamog. If you can hit Ulamog and just remove their lands before they've done anything too powerful, that's really nice. But sometimes you miss, or sometimes you just hit a card that they can deal with. Like if you play, if you hit the Sarah Emissary, you know, usually you have to say creature, or you won't be able to attack through what they've got, or they might be able to kill you with their creatures, or you have to say Planeswalker if you're up against like a Jeskai deck, and then they can just remove it with something else if you're up against removal, or, you know, if they have any removal, they can deal with it. But it you don't get to choose which bomb you're hitting. Like you can play, you know, four copies of Ulamog and four copies of Ugin the Spirit Dragon but you still don't get to know which one you're going to get. So it's like, it's it's unlike Polymorph, or it's a bit like Polymorph in that sense, but a little bit less like the Get Platinum Imperium strategy. I'm sorry, I forget the name of that format, Sorcery. Or, or you know, if you want to compare it to Escape Shift, it's like you Escape Shift, and then you don't know if you're going to get a Valakut, or if you're just going to get a Field of the Dead, or if you're going to get like a, I don't know, untapped Maze of Ith or something like that. You know, it'd be like Escape Shift, but you don't get to choose. So... The deck is powerful, and I think it's annoying, and I feel they didn't really, they didn't cover it here in the article, I don't think, but I think people feel bad about Tybalt's Trickery. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not, it's not like the usual way that magic cards, even combo decks kind of work. Like, it's, you just cast one sorcery for four mana, and then you either kind of win or don't. So, right. I, and I get that, and that's fine. I think it's okay to make changes based on feel bads, but I don't think it was like... At least from my point of view, it never seemed like the deck was so powerful that it needed to be adjusted for power level reasons. Right. Memory Lapse, on the other hand, you know, yeah. Yeah, they say that Memory Lapse was an must include in any high performing blue deck. Yeah. It was the most non the most played non land card in the arena open. <laughs> as well as the best of three ladder. I, d- I don't remember who it was. Maybe Ari Lax, but somebody tweeted, weird that they banned Time Warp, but not Memory Lapse. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Right, <laughs> you know, it's like kind of for brainstorm. They said, "Yeah, we suspended it, and uh, that went great. So we're 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 putting a ring on it. It's banned." Court quote Jay Parker. It's like because we think it's unlikely for historic to be able to safely include a combo of this speed and consistency. Tybalt trickery is banned, which is which it's fine if that's if they really don't want a, a quick and consistent combo that isn't super duper powerful. That's fair. It's like the consistency is sort of a question mark, right? Like you do hit Tybalt trickery, you don't always win. Mm-hmm. So the other changes I think are are kind of neat. I I am I have not been aware. I've been so busy. I it, has there been like a discourse about this that have people had problems with it? Because this seems like perfectly reasonable to me. But they've rebalanced. They say five of the digital only cards, like actually just functionally errated them because they can. Because they're already digital only cards, and that seems 
like a really good thing. <laughs> yeah, I think we might have talked about it on the podcast when we were like, because we spent a couple episodes going over these cards as they were being spoiled in the summertime. And I think we might have mentioned that, like, you know, other card games just nerf things, but magic can't. But now they can. So this is kind of like a fourth hidden ability on top of perpetually conjure and the other ones seek seek yeah exactly perpetually yeah. conjure seek and balance change yeah exactly yeah and they do say going forward we'll be managing formats on mtg arena in two different ways print format they're using quotes for this print formats like standard will continue to work exactly like they do in tabletop magic for live formats like historic we're adding live balancing alongside banning and suspension as a tool to address problems and make improvements in the format so and they're like look we know that people are going to have problems with this here's why we're doing it and you know feel free to to drill down in this article yourselves but let me talk a little bit about the specifics uh, in the cards so there's two very similar changes davriel's withering which previously was target creature perpetually gets minus one minus two and Davriel Soul Broker, which had a minus three ability for a target creature perpetually gets minus three, minus three. Those are both being errated to be target creature and opponent controls because apparently, as they say, we're removing the undesirable interactions with Vesper Lark that can easily result in a draw. Now that is a big sentence that's doing a lot of, you know, direction of attention here. The, the Vesper Lark aristocrats deck was like not i don't think tier one but it was like a somewhat popular strategy you'd see on the ladder it was kind of exciting thing you could do with these new cards from from jumpstart the plan is to get down a blood R for two mana of which you can play like eight and then evoke the vesper lark on turn three and in response withering it and then if they don't remove your your blood artist then you've got infinite damage because the vesper lark just keeps bringing itself back into play and then leaving because it has no toughness and then the upside of this deck is that if you don't have a blood artist but you do have a vesper and then i think no other cards in your graveyard and or no other creatures that it can target in your graveyard and the withering you can force a draw which is like a thing that's happened in magic a bunch of times not like very often but it's happened a few times throughout the course of the game's history where like there'll be a halfway decent competitive deck that if it can't win can draw and yeah it's not great for the game so i get that but it's there like it's worth noting the disappointment that i'm sure the vesper lark and the aristocrats players have with their deck being nerfed or banned basically like this is the same as saying davril's withering is banned for them so pour one out for your friend who uh, no longer has a vesper lark they can target so you're saying i shouldn't davril's whispering my opponent's vesper lark <laughs> i mean depends <laughs> What if I have a blood artist and they don't? Yeah, I mean, if your opponent's playing a Vesper Lark, you know, today or going forward, they're probably up to something different. So maybe just killing it is fine. One of the other changes is good for someone. You know, maybe they're no longer want to play their Aristocrats deck and they want to make a tribal deck. Well, good news. Faceless Agent is slightly tougher. And I mean that quite literally. Faceless Agent, formerly three mana, two one shapeshifter with changeling and when it enters the battlefield you seek a creature card of the most prevalent creature type in your library it is now a two two think i'm gonna play this just because it has one more toughness maybe if it gets a face then we'll talk <laughs> <laughs> what am i supposed to call you <laughs> sure they're stronger but they're very hard to read <laughs> yeah this one's actually pretty interesting because it's such a minute change that like it shouldn't matter like do either of you look at this change and think, oh, I got to run out and build that tribal deck now. I've got one more toughness on my generic seed creature. Not really. No, it's... Right? Yeah. <laughs> they need to give it plus two, plus three. <laughs> Not plus zero, plus one. Yeah, like competing with other cards from 2020. You're like, oh, good. Now I have a three mana two, two that seeks a card. Like, Yeah. The note is Faceless Agent is an important card for tribal decks that don't currently have the density of legal cards in historic to fill out their curve this is a simple buff to improve the experience of players using those tribal decks so it's like now this four of no longer trades with a one one token i guess yeah no that's fair okay so yeah donald smith is saying this is for the people who are already playing faceless agent we want their decks to be slightly better that that yeah. makes more sense it's still it still highlights the fact though that these digital only cards they can make tiny tweaks to them to like try to affect the metagame mm -hmm. you know they'll, they're willing to say like just just move the numbers up or down one we're going to keep you know fiddling with the dials as time goes on and that's 
I don't know. That's interesting news. Like, I guess it's probably great news in, in as long as you're into and happy about the the embracing of the digital format for the game. You know, because mm-hmm. Hearthstone will do that. They'll just like make it so that when you know something dealt three damage to something when it comes in now only deals two damage like that's a big deal but still just like moving one number or they'll change the mana cost by one or whatever so and i mean at least it does show us that they're committed to these cards being an important part of the metagame and that they want like the the thing about zeroing in on these dials is that they can try to control and create a healthy historic metagame Mm -hmm. so that's exciting and they can do it week by week yeah so hopefully that happens hopefully we see like really fun historic formats yeah now this next one i think is interesting and elson you've played with this card we did I a have. brawl stream where you were had yeah. this as your commander so sarkan wanderer to shiv this is again a very small potential potentially a small tweak sarkan is still three and a red for four loyalty he still has a minus two that deals three damage to a creature still has a plus one that says that dragon cards in your hand, i.e. dragon cards that are in your hand when you activate the ability, not just any future dragon cards, cost one generic less to cast, and you can pay any amount of generic mana instead of its actual mana cost. But previously, Sarkhan's middle ability was zero, conjure a card named Sheevan Dragon into your hand, and that ability is now plus one, which, strictly speaking, makes it better. Yeah. Their reasoning is Sarkhan's second ability is weaker than the other two, especially considering the tension between choosing to conjure Sheevan dragons versus using the first ability to fuel future minus two abilities. We're aiming to better balance and reduce the tension between the abilities. So playing against Sarkhan, I, I, I want to know how you feel, Nelson, but for me, playing against Sarkhan, that zero did not feel weak to me. <laughs> <laughs> but they're, they're saying that they don't want building up Sarkhan's loyalty for future use of his minus two ability to be part of the calculus for deciding which of the first two abilities to use. No, I appreciate this. The thing is like Shiv and Dragon by today's standards is, is a pretty weak card, right? This is meant to be the like generic dragon, you know, it, it's it's not going to be the best dragon in your deck, but it is a dragon. It's it's too expensive, but at least it's a 5-5 five, five flyer. And so when you're playing Sarkhan, like you generally have to like bring it down and kill something right away on the other side of the board and then hope to untap with it. And then you like if you've untapped with it you'd like to be able to kill something again but you're only at four loyalty so yeah then sometimes if you're like well i just need to try to untap with it one more time and then kill another thing you know you're playing a four mana plans market that's not drawing you other cards it's not like it doesn't have a ton of loyalty it can't get attacked and and live so yeah i had several games i think during that brawl where i was like okay i don't have any dragons in my hand but i just want to put another loyalty on my sarkhan so i can bolt something and then hope to start conjuring shiva dragons after that uh, either that or or you like tank for a while and you're like yeah maybe it's just better for me to lose my sarkhan and bolt things twice so yeah. i actually really like this you know the the plus one get like getting to put a loyalty on your sarkhan where you know you get something out of it like you can at least put a shiva dragon in your hand before they kill your sarkhan or before you know you have to use the next turn bolting something again yeah i i like this change and i don't think it's overpowered fair like if you're able to just sit around conjuring dragons into your hand you don't care that much about loyalty anyway i assume uh part of this is data driven as well where wizards could look at you know the numbers around how many times sarkhan's zero ability got used and then how many times sarkhan died on immediately the next turn <laughs> Right. Right. Or like, huh, you know, the we, we noticed that the win loss ratio of, of players takes a nosedive when they use Sarkhan zero ability. And I, I think that's that's interesting. You know, big if true. I'd like to think that there is <laughs> there's that kind of data driven analysis going on inside the Hasbro building or the, the wiz, uh, wizards building. No, I, I think these are interesting. Right. Like I think someone tweeted out yesterday, it might have been Saffron Olive, that, you know, the wizards should really refund people's wild cards for uh, these rebalanced cards because nobody was playing Davriel's Withering because it was a fair removal spell. Yeah, I completely agree about that. I think it's fair not to refund your wild cards if for Sarkans, but maybe for like, Davriel's is fair, right? Yeah, the the, the nerfs maybe are refundables i mean then you get into a real debate yeah with banned cards right no what is a buff versus a nerf and we know we know that magic players and i include myself in this statement are very bad at determining 
uh, what right. actually is better or worse on a given magic card. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. Like it's 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 kind of a miserable argument, and then that gets into maybe that would discourage wizards from making these kind of adjustments or these mm -hmm. rebalancings. I have to assume you can just sprinkle a bunch of wild cards on everybody, and like it doesn't really cost you that much. But I suppose there's some dollar amount when there's you know a million accounts or ten million accounts or whatever it is. So, I, but I'm on the same page. Like I I think that you know if you need to make these changes and it's worth making these changes, like it's okay that there's some cost, right? And obviously these wild cards don't, you know, they don't cost you money you currently have. It's just the idea of money that you will have in the future. But every time you do something like this, you also kind of fuel people's interests, right? Mm -hmm. like, yeah. like there's a reason they give us free packs sometimes, you know? So give, giving people wild cards when you're going to make changes to cards, I think is a healthy decision. So I hope they do that. Yeah. But they haven't said they're going to. <laughs> yeah. The last one, because there is there is one more change, is subversive acolyte. So there's this one is just like teeny tweaks from top to bottom. So still named subversive acolyte, but previously a black black mana cost for a two two, and then for two mana and pay two life, choose one and activate only once. Subversive acolyte becomes a human cleric. It gets plus one plus two and life link. Or it becomes a Phyrexian, it gets plus three plus three, and trample, and whenever it is dealt damage, sacrifice that many permanents. So now it's one in a black, so it's easier to cast. Still two mana, but one of them is generic. For a two three, so bigger toughness, if you choose the human mode, it gets plus one plus one instead of plus one plus two, because they've already given you the toughness. And if it becomes a Phyrexian, it only gets plus three, plus two, because they've already given you the toughness. So the end result is, like, when, once once it sort of transforms or whatever, it will be the same power and toughness that it was before, but they're giving you one of the toughnesses up front prior to that. And they say, it competes too directly with gifted Aetherborn for black decks looking for defensive options, and changing its mana cost adds defensive option for black decks without needing to commit heavily into black to play Gifted Aetherborn, which also costs black black for a 2-3 with death touch and lifelink. Adding a toughness lets Subversive Acolyte better fill that defensive role early in the game, and we adjusted the stat boosts to preserve the Phyrexian negator reference. Because when it when you choose Phyrexian, it becomes a 5-5 five five with Trample. It becomes Phyrexian negator. So I, I appreciate that. So this is like many little changes. Yeah, following the theme of magic players are bad at figuring out what is a buff and what is a nerf. This is just a buff, right? <laughs> like mm -hmm. you still turn into the same things for the same total amount of mana and life, but now yeah. it's easier to cast and you start off with one more toughness. So when they yeah. say competes too directly, what do they mean? They looked at deck lists and everyone's playing Gifted Aetherborn and no one's playing Subversive Acolyte. And they're like, hey, th this is a rare from the new set. Play it. <laughs> I, is that what's going on? I, I don't know, actually. Yeah, I would love to. I'd love to hear the or I'd watch the documentary on how this decision came about. Yeah. <laughs> Changing the mana cost means that it can go into black decks without having to be heavily black like Gifted Aetherborn. Sure, that makes sense. Subversive Acolyte competes too directly with Gifted Aetherborn for black decks looking for defensive options. But does it? Because without the extra toughness that they've only just added, this doesn't feel very defensive. It's just a 2-2 two -two for two. Yeah, like if you need to survive against goblins in your mono black deck, you're never playing this instead of Gifted Aetherborn if like the problem you're having is that like elves and goblins are running you over. Because then you need to spend another whole turn and two yeah. life to yeah. then turn it into the thing that gets lifelink or the big thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I would love to hear more out of the arena team here. Sorry, we should name them here. Out of Donald Smith in particular about like what the whole story was behind some first backlight and, and gifted Aetherborn and what these words mean. Like what competes to directly means in, yeah. in a hundred words rather than three. But yeah, the only thing I can figure out is just like TLDR. Subversive backlight isn't in decks and we are expecting people to play it, <laughs> you know? So, hey, give me four free rare wild cards and I'll make subversive acolytes. <laughs> I'll try them in something. But yeah, because th this change also is like, it's a, I think it's a buff. Obviously, it's a mana cost buff. But then having the toughness up front also seems better. Yeah, it's a buff. So they buffed this card. Yeah. It's, it's strictly a buff. It, it's confusing a little bit, but 
it's a buff. So, you know, they made this card better, everyone. Maybe play it. Same with Sarkhan. I don't know if Sarkhan has a place in Historic, but that would be cool. But yeah, to to circle back, I do think if they choose to hand out wild cards, it'll probably just be, it should just be for everything that gets changed, so no one has to bother figuring out what is and isn't a nerf. Yeah, I, I agree, and I think that that's a good idea, because it's, you know, it... It's like, yes, it's it's very similar. It may even be better. But strictly speaking, it's not the card you cast your wild card in for. Right. So, yeah, I mean, this card can't be brought back from the graveyard by something looking for two toughness. Oh, there you go. <laughs> right. There's always something. Mm-hmm. And, you know, speaking about nerfs and buffs a little bit more, this is something that goes on in other games, video games specifically, all the time, like any any Internet reliant video game that has patches, you know, can just change things. Blizzard games always come to mind because I've, I've played a fair bit of StarCraft 2 and they just change what the units do. Like they can they can add and remove abilities. They can change how much starting health you have. They can change how much damage you deal. So then like, you know, every if on every day on New Year's Day since like 2011 or whatever, you took three Marines in to fight against four Zerglings, it's like it would mostly look the same, but like it, it, each year it would look a little bit different, you know, mm-hmm. disregarding terrain or whatever like that. And so th- these kinds of things, nerfs usually, nerfs and buffs, they're usually called, it's like they're happening in all these other games for so long. And I hope that at Wizards R&D, there's like this big sigh of relief or like, you know, celebration and, you know, good good vibe about finally nerfs coming to magic because obviously with the print game it's like well yeah you can't you can't do that you have to sometimes there's been a few massive erratas usually just when something is left off at the printers like there's a a printing mistake and then you have to let everyone know yeah don't shuffle after you impulse that would kind of ruin the whole point of the card we just put (laughs) shuffle your library afterwards on so many cards that we accidentally slapped it on that one but functionally changing them so they are meant to do something different is yeah is new and exciting or old and exciting rather. But I, yeah, I, I think the next best thing to wild cards could be if these changes kept happening on and more and more digital cards mattered in historic such that like it was like a mini pre-release every other week. Although maybe, you know, I'm saying that and thinking about it now, maybe I actually hate that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said it and then I thought about it. You ever do that? Anyone ever do that? Oh, yeah, all the time. Absolutely. Yeah, like, right. oh, wait, hey, hey, wouldn't it be cool if, wait, no, 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 actually, <laughs> actually, I don't think it would. Yeah, no, no, that's that's perfectly reasonable. <laughs> right. But it's still, I don't know, whether, whether you're happy about this or not, it's still momentous for, for Magic the Gathering. Yeah, yeah. Oh, shoot, I forgot my rebound trigger. Hang on, I'm going to cast the the sponsor throw again now at the end of the podcast if i could actually oh good good if the, yeah awesome cool cardkingdom.com slash lrr Whew. Oh. <laughs> i'll untap in a moment uh <laughs> check out cardkingdom.com slash lrr for uh, all of your card needs can't buy those digital ones you'll have to stick with paper we really appreciate you checking out the sponsors and working with card kingdom we also really appreciate you and your continued support of our show at our at our patreon which supports not only this show but everything we do and it means a lot to us so thank you that's patreon.com slash loading ready run anything else i leapt right into that anything else that was great no yeah don't forget if you order from card kingdom and ask for a button it says wow callback so smooth segue (laughs) (laughs) it doesn't but i'll add that to the short list Uh, well until next time uh, i have been graham joined by cameron huh and Nelson. I was also here. And Jordan edits these. James runs the card reader. Heather gets them online. And thank you all so much for listening. We'll talk to you next time. Bye. 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 Bye.